It is officially recording. Anything you need, you ask, but I'm gonna to try to share my screen with you and, and give you a little bit of, um, of the presentation right now. Can everybody see this okay? Can anybody see my digital co-diagnosis for uh, better case acceptance? Yeah. Everybody got that? We're good? Uh, Andrew, I can see you. I only see four people, you're one of them. You and Tim, if you see me, can you give me a nod and just let me know that you see this? Excellent, well done. You too, Tim. Tim is kind of more of like a gecko thing, but um, so anyway, let me just show you. This is, you know, many of you know me as the guy who's running RD and trying to help you all out with other stuff, but my sweet spot for 15 years was traveling the world, teaching people how to increase case acceptance. And I was, um, I was brought in as a consultant. So I'm not saying that because I'm anybody special. I'm just letting you know that um, these are techniques and concepts that I spent a lot of time uh, trying to really perfect and, and learn and, and help people really uh, understand how to get better case acceptance. And it doesn't matter if you're ortho, surgery, perio, GP, um, the concepts we're gonna talk about are universal. And we're gonna talk about some of the verbal skills as we move through it. And bear with me as I just try to go through this. I've never done this presentation um, in, uh, on the web in this format, so hopefully it'll come across. And right now, the only two people I can see are Tim and Andrew. So if there's a problem, guys, uh, I can't even see, because I'm sharing the screen, I can't see the, um, I'm going to see if I can minimize this. So bear with me for a second here. Sorry, guys. Uh, I'm going to stop share for a second. Sorry, bear with me for just a moment. I'm just gonna try to, let me see if this optimized for share full video clip, okay. So let's just see. Okay, now I got it, good. So um, you don't see the pictures of you all in front of this, correct? You're just seeing a full screen, correct? Okay, good. So this is what tonight's gonna be a little bit like. And for those of you who saw me speak at MKS, you're familiar with this, it's gonna be drinking from the fire hose. Uh, I will always be happy to work with any of you one-on-one, -on -one, uh, just as a courtesy to try to help you with this if you have follow-up questions. But I'm gonna throw a lot of information at you. And you, you all know all about me, about my history. I didn't edit this because you know some of you know about me and others don't. But at the end of the day, uh, I've worked in both high volume, low volume. Uh, this is my family, so I'm a blessed man. 23 years with my wife, um, I've got two daughters, 13 and 17, and uh, this one here just got a full ride scholarship, University of Arizona. So she starts there in June, so thank goodness for good ACT scores. And these two are uh, devil one, devil two. They're my twins, both in ortho, uh, both refusing to brush their teeth, uh, both with white spot lesions everywhere. So life is good, and of course my lovely wife of uh, 23 years, so any of you who are going to the cruise will get to hang out with me and my wife and my three children who will end up being tied to the front of the ship. So um, I love photography, this is my thing, this is my National Geographic cover, I call it. Uh, this was at Zion National Park, if anybody here uh, knows it. And I do a lot of infrared photography where I just, I, it's not black and white, it just sort of picks up reflected light. And so I've really been into photography for years and it sort of translated its way into orthodontics. I, I, into my ortho photography, but I wanna show you something real quickly, and I'm gonna see if this will run for you real fast, and I apologize. Can't do it, sorry all, my, my apologies. Um, and not only have I done that, but I can't even find my, ah, there we go. So I wanna go past that, ask a question at any point. I am gonna ask you because I cannot see you because of the way this is set up right now. Just unmute yourself and ask a question if you have one. Um, no matter what question is, ask it, and let's just have some fun doing this. And for many of you, uh, I tend to run my life by not being scared of anything business-wise. I'm scared of a lot outside of business, but I'll, I'll, there's nothing I'm afraid of if it's a calculated risk. And so when I go to a lecture or I hear somebody speak, I'm always sort of thinking about how I can implement it. But it wasn't until probably about five years ago I realized that everybody's not built that way. And so as a result, some of you may be a little bit worried or concerned or that little voice may creep into your head and say, I can't do this or this won't work in my practice or my patients will not go for this. And I'm only asking you for the next 45 minutes to an hour, suspend that. Uh, 
Henry Ford used to say it, and I think it's in the presentation, whether you think you can or you think you can't, you're generally right. And if you think you can increase your case acceptance, uh, if you think you can get your case acceptance over 90% consistently, uh, you can, and it's doable, and you can get there. And I'll just show you some of the things I've learned. So um, I can't see you all, but Becca, are you out there tonight? Uh, or are you probably taking care of your gorgeous daughter? If you're there, let me know. But um, Rebecca Bacow, who's in our group, was actually worked alongside of me as my associate when I was a GP, and she was a GP. And a lot of this I, I worked with her on, and she taught me a lot as my associate. I got to use her as my guinea pig. And I took a six-day-a-week insurance-driven practice to three-and-a-half days a week uh, with the same revenue in less than four years, all by using the technique I'm going to show you. And I've had every marketing expert in the world in my practice. Um, I probably spent about a quarter of a million dollars in the first three years of owning my practice on consultants, and nobody had an answer for uh, increasing dollars per patient. Um, for us, it's not that big of an issue. It's not dollars per patient as much as it is case acceptance. And like many of you, I don't want to work harder. I want to work smarter. So um, here's a guy comes into my office, a uh, big old diastema between his front teeth. Uh, you know, it's a very tough case, as you probably all would know, because he only wants to treat his upper teeth. He doesn't want to do anything with his lower, and he's a perfect soft in class one occlusion. And it, I found it almost impossible to treat this without overjet um, as a class one socked in. So he said, well, I really want veneers. So if you ever want to, uh, we can always work on Photoshop uh, webinar and I can teach you all how to use Photoshop. But what, I, what you're seeing here is not pretty and I didn't want it to be pretty. I wanted it to be ugly. I wanted it to be disgusting. I wanted it to be something he looked at and said, gross. I want to treat both arches. Instead, of course, he said how much he loved it. But what you're seeing took me no more than probably uh, 15 to 30 seconds to mock up. And I use this for diastemas. I use it to show people how to increase in size ledge or to decrease in size ledge so that I can give them a rough idea of what they will look like. I don't do it often, but in this particular case, he said, oh, I love it. I want to go with this. And of course, I took him into the clinic. I have no problem mocking people up. And in another two minutes, don't mind my uh, bonding agent, the yellow you see, but I mocked him up again in probably another two minutes hoping that he would hate it, but of course he loved it. Um, I sent him to my general dentist friends and told them to uh, take care of it, and they did, and he ended up referring me his wife, who ended up referring me tons of patients, all because I ended up mocking him up and sending him to a general dentist. So digital technology is gonna help us all really, really um, develop our practices, and oftentimes when we talk about digital technology, uh, we're talking about things like um, social media, uh, we're talking about things like an iTero. Um, we're talking about a lot of things that unfortunately uh, relate more to social media and the things that don't help with case acceptance. They get people through the door. So I'm going to talk about tonight specifically uh, PowerPoint uh, in some respects, but mostly simply just Dolphin or whatever image management program you're using is the only digital technology you're going to need for this. But if you ever want to learn this kind of digital technology uh, with how to Photoshop, I'm happy to teach it. So what did I want when I started this? I wanted all these things. I wanted increased net income, a happier, motivated team, better patient relationships, less stress, uh, engaged patient, predictability. Um, I wanted people to understand what it was they were doing because as hard as we think we have it in orthodontics, restorative dentistry is immeasurably more difficult to sell cases. Uh, we have it so easy in orthodontics that I kind of laugh when I hear people complaining about case acceptance and they say that we've got uh, a tough neighborhood or prices are low or I've got lots of competitors. Well, I want you to imagine a patient comes into your office for a six-month cleaning and you determine that they need about $60,000 worth of dentistry between yourself and the periodontist. And you've got to sit with a person who thought all they needed was a cleaning and you need to convince them to spend that money and to make their investment in their health. Um, I routinely did that, and it's only because I learned the techniques I'm going to show you. So when someone comes in knowing they need braces, and the cost is only about five to seven grand, I'm not exaggerating when I say it's shooting fish in a barrel. And that's why my case acceptance generally hovers around 90% for people who are ready for treatment. And that's why of that 90%, probably about 85% are same-day starts. And we can debate that on the board about what consider, what's constituting a same-day start but I'm honest, I'm moral, I don't lie to patients, I never mislead them. On the contrary, 
what we're going to talk about is a way to give them more education than they've ever had in a shorter period of time and make them take ownership for it themselves. And it's a form of motivational interviewing. So if you want to increase your, your production, of course, we can increase the number of new patients by marketing. Um, and again, if you gross to 800 and put 1% into marketing, that's $8,000, which gets you next to nothing today. You can sign up for more insurances, which there's nothing wrong with if you can get the money you're looking for. Um, you can certainly cut our costs, but I don't think any of us wants to like cut out a better lab or stop using digital technology or cut team members. So what I came up with is I wanted to increase the revenue based upon what we already had. And if people came into my office, I wanted them to convert um, both as a restorative dentist and as an orthodontist. So how? Just patient-centered comprehensive care. So what I want you to do is I want you to look at things from a different perspective tonight. Because all of you sit in your practice on a regular basis. Uh, you look around your office. You know how you do things. Uh, if you're like me, hopefully you travel to other ortho practices to watch them work and spend the day with them. Uh, I just got back from Destin, Florida this past uh, Monday. I flew in for the day and came home uh, with Doug, my partner, and we, um, we got to watch Dr. Scott Runnels. Mike, you know, and Mike Reagan knows him. Uh, Scott is a superstar. Uh, he's going to be joining, hopefully, our group very shortly, and he is going to be a wealth of information. Um, and we're talking to a guy who does really solid numbers with an overhead of about 42%. And he wouldn't mind me sharing that with you because he said it on Orthopreneurs. Um, and he runs an amazing office and he, and he does not kill himself and he sees 80 patients a day and it's the kind of practice that I think we'd all like to have. So I want you to take a step out and look at your practice objectively as if you were somebody walking through the door and see things through a different light. And that's why I show this picture of the big grasshopper on the pole because when you look at it from a different perspective, it really looks like this. And the child is down here and this is what it looks like. So let's look at things from a different perspective and remember what I said, whether you think you can or you think you can't, you're right, okay? So uh, we all know about the camera, it's affordable, easy. I'm gonna fly through a few of these things. I just wanna make it clear that I am not this guy that you see in front of you, I'm this guy. I'm the one who wants to get an amazing image to show to patients, still accept care a great lateral arc shot. And you're looking at one of the first zirconia bridges ever made in the United States with full zirconia porcelain. My lab bill for this case, you're looking at $17,500. But when I say that ortho, for me at least, is hey Darren, can you uh, mute yourself please, sir, if you don't mind. Sorry. Right. No, no worries. I, it just came up Darren making noise. So, <laughs> so my point though here is this case here, the lab bill is three times what we charge patients for ortho. So like I said, what we're doing here is shooting fish in a barrel, and that's where she started. So pictures tell a story, right? Every one of these pictures, we're all too young to remember most of these, they tell a story. And nothing's been proven to tell a story better in, in ortho and in dentistry than a good picture. And when you show these pictures, they evoke emotion in patients. And so, yeah, I'm all in, I'm all in favor of throwing... Uh, pictures of teeth up on the wall and you know nowadays with digital technology again if you ever want to learn how to do this we can overlay an x-ray to show people why they have altered passive eruption and why potentially you know just intruding teeth may not be right or crown lengthening around these crowns that, that they presented with may not be right and you know all you have to do in, in literally about a minute's worth of time you can do these sorts of things to show them to patients and open up their eyes and they'll realize that maybe putting crowns on the teeth that they had originally was not as good idea as all they needed was just some simple crown lengthening back in the day, right? Veneers, I, one, only one of these is a veneer and it's not this one, it's this one, um, former life pictures. But again, show your cases to patients with amazing technology, with great pictures, and they will definitely uh, respect what you're doing. Uh, when I was a GP, I used to collaborate with a lot of orthodontists and that's what eventually got me to become an orthodontist. And at least now I put the bracket on the tooth. Um, I've learned that much in ortho residency, but this was a case that an orthodontist sent me and wanted me to help bail out. And without pictures, we can't collaborate. And again, these are the kind of cases that I dealt with on a regular basis. And I needed to get people to understand what was going on because there's no way in the world that they'll understand the difficulty associated with their case if in fact um, I can't show it to them and I can't get them to take ownership. So I'm gonna move a little bit through some of these communication tools that don't matter, and I'm gonna go into the real heart of what is digital co-diagnosis. It's a term that I came up with back in 2000, and 
probably six. I did a three-part series on this in dental economics. They had asked me to write it up, and I did. And I, I want to make it clear to you. This is an offshoot of something called motivational interviewing. Uh, you're going to hear a lot more about it in the next decade because we've gone in the medical world from the autonomous model, I'm sorry, um, where the doctor has a paternalistic model, not autonomy, but paternalistic. Uh, all of us who had to take master's level courses or these sorts of things in residency, you know, rue the day that we had to learn about, you know, paternalism versus autonomy. But paternalism was Marcus Welby in the 50s who walked into a room and said, you have cancer, we need to remove your leg. And the patient looked and says, okay. We realized in the 80s that that wasn't the way to treat people. So then they switched to autonomy, where you said people have ability to have choices. And the doctor would walk in and go, you have cancer. How would you like to treat this? And they'd say, well, don't cut my leg off. And they'd say, okay, great, we'll do it that way. And the patient died of metastasis. So they realized that that didn't work either. And so the concept of, of um, motivational interviewing came about where the patient is asked questions, interviewing, to motivate them to give answers that come out of their mouth, which in turn creates a visceral ownership of what's coming out of their mouth. You know, the old saying, it's really hard to nod your head no when you say yes, right? You saw my head bob. It's very difficult. You have to really work on that because viscerally, it has an effect on you when you say no, right? Yes. Try it sometime and you'll see it's tough. So when patients say things out of their own mouth that relate to their health care, it means more to them than when you tell it to them. So I want you to see this a little bit because if you think that case acceptance begins when the patient says yes or no, you're mistaken. And how do I know this? I've looked at this over and over again in offices I've worked with, uh, in my own office. I tested, I A, B tested, do it this way and do it this way and, and charted the results. So let's start a little bit with some of the things that happen when a patient walks into your office that you should be giving thought to when you do your um, you do your exam with them or when you treat them as a new patient per se. And I'm going to pause right now and say, are there any questions that anybody has that I can answer so far? If there are, I can't see you because I've got the screen up, but I can certainly hear you. So please unmute yourself and ask if you've got a question. And if I don't hear anything in 10 seconds, we'll keep going. Okay, good. So, um, let's go here. Guy walks into the dentist's office. Well, what does that mean? There are questions I want you to think about. What do you do before the exam? So patient calls the office. Uh, they come in. What are you doing? How are you marketing? How are you engaging them? How are you getting them to see that your office is different? Are you doing a whiteboard like I have for my office, which we've talked about and I can always go over again at some point. Um, how are you sending out marketing materials? Uh, how are you finding out if they're ready to buy? Uh, what Leanne Panici refers to as um, pre-closing, right? How do you know if that person is shopping around to eight or nine orthodontists or you're the only one? Uh, are they ready to start that day? Aren't these things that would be nice to know before you do it? Um, how do you determine the treatment plan? How do you explain to them what the next step is? Do you have a clear, repeatable process to educate and motivate or do you treat everybody a little bit differently? And these are things you need to start thinking about. And of course, you're always presenting the best care you can provide, but with this group, it's not even a question I'm gonna bring up. So those of you who saw me at MKS, um, I, 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 this is my soapbox. Uh, it's it's um, 20 minutes in, and I'm gonna go through it really quickly, but I want you to mind something when you go back to your office tomorrow. And this is something uh, next year at the Orthopreneurs Get Together we're gonna have in May and I'll, I'll talk about that in a minute. I will do hands-on photography for you all. Anybody who comes out, we'll work on that together. But I want you to look at this image, which is what I consider to be an appropriate lateral arch image for every picture. Um, one of my uh, favorite guys, and who's been a mentor to me clinically, Mike Reagan, uh, who came to my program when I was in school, is out there right now. And uh, Mike would appreciate the fact that if you're going to show results from a carrier appliance, this particular picture will unequivocally show you the results of distalization of the upper or lower arch. And so I took this picture to show you all that 
when I was back in, as a GP and when I went through my ortho residency, I used that time to take one of the residents that I was working with and draw a line through the mesial buccal cusp and the buccal groove and through the long axis, sort of at the height of contour of the cuspids, just to show what a lateral arch shot should look like. Uh, excuse me, what are you showing me, son? Oh, I'm sorry, I gotta get water for my son. Hold on one second. So what this, what this shows um, is a perfect lateral arch shot that, here you go, buddy. You wanna say hi? Hello. Come say hi. Zach saying hi. Hello. Bye, Zach. So anyway, the lateral arch. Hi, Zach. Arch, somebody, John, everybody says hello to you, Zach. So here's, here's what I want you to notice. This shot, we'd all agree, is a decent shot for a lateral arch shot. But what happens when our assistant or we don't have proper mirror and retractor use and, and capture it the way Angle wanted us to capture it? And this is much more common in the images that we see in our offices. And I'm guilty of it as much as you are, though it's usually my assistants, not me, because I know what to look for. And notice how we took this patient who was class two end on and made them appear class one. Now, I'm never going to accuse anybody of being dishonest on purpose, but there is a bit of an intellectual dishonesty here. If we want to look at our cases and really observe and say, wow, look at that locked in class one, when in fact it's not. It's, a, it's, an, it's not you know, a full end on class two, but it's certainly not a class one. And so when you're taking your images, um, please do me a favor and remember this image and remember what it looks like. And do your best to try to get a, a lateral arch shot that's straight on. Because I will tell you, this particular image that you're looking at probably sells more ortho in my practice than any other image that I'll ever take. Um, this 90 degree shot, not this particular one with the lines, but the fact that when people see their class two end on, and I've described to them what class one is, they see this and I, and I ask them, should your teeth come together like a set of gears, right? Where they, and I show them this, and I actually, um, I'll show you a picture that I have next to my, uh, my, my screen in my office that, that shows what I call a perfect occlusion. And if you remind me, I'll upload it uh, onto, um, onto our group so you can download it and print it. Um, but again, I show them that. I say, should your teeth hit like gears or should they hit more like rocks? Where they notice in my language, should they hit nice and smoothly like gears or should they hit like rocks that kind of like bang into each other? Now you'd have to be a moron to not understand where I'm leading you, but patients don't care. So when I say, should it hit like this smoothly or like rocks, they always say, well, smoothly, I say exactly. Now when you look at this image, does it look like they're hitting like gears or do they kind of look like they're banging into each other? right, with little crack lines. And for anybody who says that, you know, there's no such thing as a pathologic occlusion, look at where that cusp tip is and look at that crack line coming off that tooth. This is reality. Now, I tell them that nobody's ever going to die of crooked teeth, but the patients who I've seen in 25 years who have more joint problems, more muscle problems, a more gingival recession, more often than not have a pathologic occlusion. And when they see this and they understand it, I don't really have a big problem getting them to go through treatment. But again, I don't tell them they have to have treatment. I show them these images and they get it and I'll walk you through that in a little bit. But I just wanted to take a minute to show you that when you look at your lateral shots, this is what should be looking straight onto the camera. And you'll notice how this area here in the front kind of trails off and disappears. However, when you're shooting it incorrectly, the cuspid and lateral incisor are straight on to the camera and everything else is trailing off. So I'm here to give you uh, permission, clemency, dispensation. Uh, you can cut off second molars to get a perfect straight on class one or class two end on picture. Because all too often, our assistants try to capture a second molar and then everything looks like this in that second picture. Whereas if we cut off the second molar, you know, it's much easier to get a really straight, shot straight on. So does anybody have any questions about this at all? Please don't hesitate to ask. Uh, nobody will make fun of your question except me maybe and then we'll all laugh at you. So feel free to ask a question. No questions? Anybody? Anyone? Bueller? Okay.
So if there's no questions, um, I'm just looking to see if I can see the chat. Um, uh, so here's a question from Jim. And by the way, yes, Ruse, I'll send the article. I don't which articles are you referring to, Ruse? You mind ask, mentioning it again? The dental economics, the one that you mentioned. Yeah, you know, the weirdest part about it is they, may have, they, they might very well have been horrible because they seem to have disappeared from the web. Um, the, the, I can help if I can find it. No, I'll, if anybody can find it, Ruse, I know it's you. Um, but I'll look for it and give you the trouble. It's possible that uh, Al Gore removed it from the web, um, but if he didn't, I will find it for you, okay? Um, so Jim, Jim asks, when I'm examining a teenager, are you asking the questions of the patient and assuming the parents pick up on it? Um, no, and yes. So let me show you real quickly what I'm doing, and I figured out how to see chat, so now we're all good. So let's just say, um, we've got this picture uh, here in front of us on the left side of the screen. And I have that up on the wall. I'm sorry. Uh, I'm going to go back here for a second. I'm going to have a picture on the wall of a perfect class one occlusion. Right? Everything's locked in. And it says on the wall, right next to my screen, it says ideal occlusion right across it. It says an, an ideal bite. And remember, We've been trained as clinicians. Do not use words patients don't know. I cannot stand it when I hear people talk about myofunctional problems or, um, you know, your occlusion is pathologic. They don't understand this. You've got to use words they know. So I have a picture that says an ideal bite, and it shows a frontal shot of a beautiful smile arc and a consonant smile. And I've got right below it a lateral arch image just like this, clean, crisp, with a perfect class one locked in occlusion. And so I'll look at the screen, and let's assume this is a teenager, Jim, and um, her parents are sitting next to her, or her mom, whomever, and I'll be talking to the mom mostly, because that's the decision maker. So I'll look at mom and I'll say, so I want you to, to notice here, on, I want you to look at her teeth and the way they hit, and then I'll point to the screen on the left. Now, we're getting ahead of ourselves, but what the heck, it was a great question, so let's jump the gun a little bit, and let's get into motivational interviewing and digital co-diagnosis, because that's what you're really here for. So I turn to mom and I say, when you look at the screen on the left here and you see this gorgeous bite, right? Um, do the teeth, thank you, Ruse. Um, Ruse has given you the link to the article, so, um, but there's three parts and often you'll only find one. Uh, but I digress, squirrel. So I say to mom, look at the wall to the left of the screen. Do the teeth look like they're hitting beautiful? Now remember, adjectives, adjectives and adverbs, they are your best friend. And I want you to think that you're making a case to the jury and you're being honest and passionate. Now I understand that some of you may not be smooth talkers, but this is your career. This is your livelihood. You need to work on this at least a little bit. You need to practice it. And if you're embarrassed, get out your camera, video yourself doing this alone as if you were talking to somebody in the chair but you have to practice this. And I've said it so many times, it just comes out smoothly. So Mrs. Jones, Mrs. Gleason, your young son, Jim, is sitting there in the chair. And I want you to look at that picture over there next to the screen. Um, and they just, they usually will continue to look at the screen and you have to look at their eyes because they don't realize there's something off camera. So you'll say, no, 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 over there on the wall. And they'll look and you'll say, does it look like the teeth are hitting nice and smoothly and coming together like a set of gears? Or do they look like they're hitting like, and look at my face as I'm saying this, does it look like they're hitting like, a, like rocks banging into each other? And then they'll look over at the screen and they'll say, um, yeah, it kind of looks like they're banging like rocks. Now remember, you may think this is all drivel, but I'm telling you, studies will say that when it comes out of their own mouth, they believe it and you're not selling them on anything, and they'll never say you talk them into anything. So they'll say, yeah, it kind of looks like they're banging like rocks. They'll say, and you have to compliment them. Exactly, good point. And then you can turn and say, Jim, do you see what we're talking about? And Jim will go, yes, I do. And so at that point you go, great. So now you go on and you say, so my concerns, right? Remember, you're not telling them what to do. You're telling them your concerns. So you say, so, um, Ms. Gleason, my concerns are that um, we typically will see 
uh, a greater um, number of individuals in my career who have joint problems, muscle problems, uh, things that we would consider to be unfortunate things to have to live with, relate to bites when things are banging together as opposed to the exquisitely choreographed bite when the good Lord gets it right and puts everything together. And so first things first, nobody's ever died of crooked teeth. But if Jim were my son, um, I would believe that it's probably better to have a bite that hits like this than like this. Would you agree with me? You have to check in and say, would you agree with me? And nobody in their right mind is going to say no. The worst answer you might ever get is, yeah, I guess. Say exactly. All right. You can check in with the teenager again at this point if you want to. And then just say, great. Um, and you have two choices. If you're really uncomfortable with selling, if you're really uncomfortable, all you have to do is look them in the eyes. So there's a solution I have for you. Do you mind if I talk to you about it? Right? You've asked permission. Um, nobody will ever say no because they're there to hear you. Uh, as a general dentist, they would say no because they never came to hear this. They came to get a cleaning, but it was rare. So you say, do you mind if I talk to you about it? That's if you're not a people person and you're not a salesperson. If you are in sales, all you have to do is look at them and say, great, I'm really glad to hear that because I want to talk to you about some solutions. So if the teeth are hitting like this and I want them to hit like this, right, and I have to move the teeth, what's the only option we've got? And they're going to say braces. And I'll say, of course, and that's why you came here. So it becomes really, really easy to use these pictures to get them to engage in the process, right? Because you haven't had to explain to them a thing. You've just shown them this is bad, this is good. Which would you rather have? And they always say good. I say fantastic. Well, I'm here to tell you that I can do that for you. And however you want to say that. Now, motivational interviewing goes one step further because in the picture in front of you, you, we always, or at least I always tell patients they're going to have to wear elastics. So then I would say to them, so this is where I'll turn to the kid because mom wants to see you, you know, be a, a great parent for their child because they don't want to do it. So you'll say, if your teeth hit like this, Jim, and I want your teeth to hit like this, right? And um, just a quick yes or no. Can you guys see my cursor as I move it around on the screen? Anyone? Yes. Great. Thank you. So I'll say to Jim, so Jim, um, if I want these teeth to go back and I want these teeth to go forward, what do you think we have to have you do from this tooth to this tooth to get them to come together? Notice I didn't say you're going to have to wear rubber bands. What do you think we're going to have to have you do to pull this forward and pull this back? What kind of a thing do you think can do that? Now, Good question, Glenn? Yes, sir. Um, so I'm just curious because it seems like you really spend time speaking with your patients and giving them really undivided attention. How much time do you slot for a consult? As much as I have. And it's a great question. <laughs> now, I, I know it sounds funny. So I've got three chairs going. I've got one assistant out sick. I've got one, one assistant running the clinic. And I've got my headset in, right? I wear a headset. So if I don't hear my assistant say, Dr. Krieger, we're ready for you at chair two, I'm going, right? Because um, I can never give them enough time if I'm not going to run behind. Now, I won't go there for two hours. But let's, you want to, Jonathan, you want me to go real time for you knowing that I've got a bonding waiting for me in the other room? I'll take that as a yeah. yeah. Sure, yeah, that was a yeah. Okay, so here, here's what I do real quickly. So Mrs. Johnson, as you can see here, this is a great picture of Jim's teeth, um, right? If you look at the picture to the left of you, you can see an ideal bite. Do you think that Jim's teeth, they hit like in the picture, like a set of gears, nice and smoothly, or do you think they hit like rocks, um, a little bit more harsh and you know, causing things that might create like cracks and stuff? And she'll say, like Rock say exactly. So the good news is um, I can correct him and help him go from here to here really nicely with orthodontics. It's what we do every day. Uh, it's very straightforward. Um, how does that sound to you? And they might say yes, no, finances. But I've already learned ahead of time whether finances are an issue because we did that at closing, uh, pre-closing on the phone. And we can talk about that in the Q&A session. So she'll say, yeah, yeah, it sounds great. I say, awesome. In just a second, Larissa, my treatment coordinator, uh, is going to talk to you about options. Um, but are there any questions I can answer for you about 
how we're going to help Jim get from here to here. And nine times out of 10, there's not really any major questions. But before I leave the room, I'm going to say two things to her. I'm going to say, so what's important for you to realize, Jim, is what I just told you about this. And he's going to say elastics and great, wonderful. So when I told you guys it's going to take 18 months to fix this case or 24 months, that's counting on Jim's involvement. So Jim, can I count on you to do what we just talked about? And of course, mom and dad look over, you know, waiting to jump on him. And he says, sure. I say, fantastic. I shake his hand or her hand. I say, I get up to leave and I turn to the mother or the father. And again, all of this is recorded. So you can always listen to this again. And I look at them and I say, I don't know the first thing about you. For all I know, you might own a yacht or a jet and money doesn't play any role in your life. But if you're like most of us, notice I said us, not patients. If you're like most of us, money plays a role in our lives. So I just want to let you know that in my practice, we'll always find a way to make it affordable for you. Now, if I was the wrong orthodontist for you, I could give it to you for free and you'd say it doesn't work. But if I'm the right orthodontist for you, we'll make it work for you financially. And then I turn to my treatment quarter and say, Larissa here has all the power to come up with a plan that's affordable for you. So I'm not the least expensive in town and I'm certainly not the most, but nobody ever leaves my practice because they can't afford treatment because Larissa here is gonna make it work for you. And with that, I shake their hand, they thank me, I walk out the door, and usually about four minutes later, Larissa brings the kid back for a starting scan. So again, I, oh, when I started doing that, the whole price match competition thing went out the window. Notice I didn't drop my price. Notice I didn't try to sell them on anything. I just looked them in the eye. And as I learned from Dr. Michael Schuster from the Schuster Center back around 1998, always intercept possible objections before it becomes their objection. I know they're going to ask me about money. Why? Because when we took the new patient intake call, we did a pre-close. We know that money's huge for them. So I'm going to say that to them before they say I need to be able to afford it because I've already told them it's going to be affordable. So the whole process moves smoother and I can be in a room and do this in three to five minutes, start to finish. If I've got time, I'll spend it with patients. But um, historically, um, I can get it done in about three to five minutes if I'm really pushing hard, but that's really fast. Did I answer your question okay, Jonathan? Glenn, I got a question real quick. Definitely. Okay. Yes, sir, Tim. Uh, can you quickly go over how you bring up money on the intake call? Okay. So, um, sorry, my foot's stuck in my chair. Okay. So, um, and I'll answer your question, Vivian, in just a second about flexibility. So, I don't have it in front of me, and anybody who's on the cruise, I'll try to remember to bring one with me, and certainly next year, whenever we're together, we can talk about this stuff. But Liam Panici, uh, for those of you who came to her web conference, she gave us some real golden tips. Um, and I sent my TC to her twice. And one of the things she has is a pre-sale. So, um, Tim, I'm going to use you as my example, okay? Um, and I want you to role play with me, if you don't mind, okay? And um, I'm going to say, are you there, Tim? Can you hear me okay? I'm here. I'm in. Okay. Let's so, do it. Okay. Did you put the nurse's uniform on? Hold on. I'll be right back. Just so you guys know that Tim is my RD partner, my accountability partner. So we role play a lot. So he's got a whole set of <laughs> costumes. It works great. Um, so I say, um, thank you for calling Krieger Orthodontics. How can I help you? You call. We take your information, what have you. And then I'm going to turn my, – my scheduling coordinator is going to say – um, so, uh, Dr. Finelli, um, if, if Dr. Krieger finds that little Jimmy requires orthodontics and time permits, would you be interested in getting started the day of the appointment of the exam? And then she pauses. Now, Tim, what's your answer to me? Possibly. Depends okay. on insurance, fees. Okay. Great. And so what's important is your assistant now needs to say back, okay, so, um, so if I understand this properly, Tim, if the finances make sense, it's something you'd be interested in? Yes. Okay. Fantastic. So you're, you're, so you're selling the, the same day start or, or you're, you're planting the seed for the same day start right then and there. I'm, I'm planting the seed for commitment. Okay. Are you committed 
So because, because you might say to me, if I say, if we could start the same day, would you start? You could easily say to me, no, we're shopping around to four or five orthodontists, right? And we've decided my husband has to be there and he really wants to look at the treatment plan fees because he's not going to let me get started no matter what, right? And my, my assistant, my scheduling coordinator writes from one to five, one being not ready, five being, um, they say to her, yeah, he's out of school that day. So if you guys could start, it would really be amazing before she even asks, right? Because we all get those. So she's writing on this sheet one through five. And that way that sheet goes to my treatment coordinator the day of the exam. And she can look and see, oh, it's a one. Why? Oh, because their best friend is an orthodontist and they're just coming to us to get a price to take it to their friend. That doesn't happen, but you get the point. So even when I see something, um, even when I see somebody who says they're a one, I go into that exam that we're going to get started that day. And I do so. Um, and I will tell you that the overwhelming majority of people who are, are, are a one or a two because of price shopping started my practice. It's the ones or the twos who say they're waiting for an FSA next year and it's January of this year. And they say, we don't have any insurance, but we're getting some in six months. Um, you know, those sorts of things are the ones you just can't really get around easily. But if someone says they're price shopping, fantastic. I finished that conversation like I told you guys before, and they understand that I'm not the cheapest, I'm not the most expensive, but I will make it affordable for you. And when they hear that, they almost every single time will start right there. Almost every single t time they will start, and um, it works out beautifully. So that, Tim, did I answer that okay for you? Yeah, yeah that's perfect. Thank you. Okay, and that's called a pre-close. A uh, pre-sale, pre-close, uh, Leanne has a name for it, but it doesn't matter. It's your way of your front desk finding out ahead of time, how serious is this person about starting? And as a secondary note, what your front desk needs to be asking in the same phone call and asked exactly like this is that, oh, by the way, who else in the family might need an orthodontic exam to save you a trip so we can do it on the same day? And you'll be amazed at how many times the parent will go, oh, well, he's got an eight-year-old brother. Oh, great. Bring him in. We'll take a look real quick. And right? That's how you get your new patient's exams increased. And at the very least, they now become a recall patient. So just a little thing I learned from Leanne on that one. So Vivian, how much flexibility do I give the TC? All flexibility. I trust her. I believe in her. She wants to get starts going. Uh, she knows what I require and what I don't. But if she's got a, like for instance, right now, we have tons of patients who say, I've got an FSA that starts in January. Can I start now and pay you in January? Absolutely. No problem. Um, you know, can I pay 250 down now and pay you another 250 next month? Absolutely. Um, I, I don't have full chairs. I started three years ago. I work three to four columns of patients. An empty chair costs me more than a chair that pays me $250. I know you could get into the analytics and argue that, but knowing that 98% of my patients are going to pay me in full, who cares? I have some pay in fulls who subsidize my uh, 250 or 500s. And you might sit there and go, wow, 500, that's why your case acceptance is so high. Great. I love that. Um, so Vivian, does that answer your question about flexibility? I'm assuming that's a yes. So um, next question, what advantage of doing photos over scan before consults? We tried for a little while to do all um, records before consult, but it was just taking too long. So I recently did do scan over photos. I like scan since I can turn T360, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I, it makes no difference what you do, right? You could potentially um, use a, a, a wand camera to take a picture. It's not, it's not what you show them other than them seeing their condition somehow, but them saying it out of their own mouth, yes, I see the problem. Here is what the problem is. Here is how uh, I want to fix it. Uh, I believe that this is how we need to go through it. I mean, just walk them through with a scan or with photos. I do photos because photos are quick, and I'm the digital code diagnosis guy. I love photos. I'm a photography guy, and my team can take a beautiful set of photos in four minutes. So I have my scanners sitting in clinic scanning people, but if you go to guys like my friend Dovi Prero, Dovi does like a treatment simulation on everybody. I don't need a treatment simulation. You know, I, I just started doing them just because I feel like I have to, but my case acceptance is around 90% without any scanning. So I like not scanning because then when the patient says, yes, I want to get started, I have something tangible 
to go do. I say, okay, great. You fill out the contract, mom. I'm going to take a little Timmy back. We're going to scan him and we're going to get started with this case. And I'm going to scan him for indirect bonding retainers or I'm going to scan him for Invisalign or whatever, but we've now started. If I scan ahead of time, then there's just a transfer of money. And how do I justify having started them that day? You could say, well, now we're going to go take our photos and our lateral ceph. But, you know, I really like the photos and the lateral ceph and the pan to help me diagnose the case. And then I save the scan itself for later on. Vivian, does that help you? I'm assuming that's a yes. So thank you. Um, next question by Vivian is what about discounts? I give discounts. I've got no problem. Um, so I think I've, I've shared my treatment form that I learned from Chase, uh, Landy Chase. Uh, if you've never read his books, Yes to Treatment and No to Lost Cases, go order them. They're really good reads. They're short. They're easy. Buy one for your TC and sit and do it as like a book club with her or him. Um, he says three options. I'm not an OrthoFi guy. My case acceptance actually dropped dramatically when I started using OrthoFi and I was trained very well on it. Um, I think the three options that Landy Chase talks about are really good. Pay in full, FSA, and minimal down payment. Uh, I don't confuse them. She just slides it across and shows them three options. So if you pay in full, you get a $350 discount. Uh, if you um, pay half now and half in a year for your FSA, you'll get a $175 total dollar discount. And if you pay $500 down, you get no discount. And those are my three. If there's a sibling in treatment, we give $400 more. Um, but that's about the extent. Of, I gave $1,000 off today to a former veteran. Um, she'd been treated as a kid. She relapsed and just wanted to do it. it seemed like she had insurance that paid $2,500. I felt good about giving her $1,000 off um, as a thank you, you know, for service to our country. Um, she's about a five foot tall former MP and I didn't want her to break my arm. So um, she was really appreciative of it. And more importantly, I felt better about it than she did because I wanted to help her. So um, that's all about discounts. Uh, does my same day start include bonding the brackets or just scan radiographs? Radiographs, Leon, have already been taken by me. Um, and again, we're getting into an area which I'm thrilled to talk about, but I want to make it very clear. This is, I, I'm not the world expert on this. I'm only sharing with you what works for me, but I guess you want to hear that. So my same day start includes scan. If, if they're a carrier case, uh, we're going to scan them um, and take a lower alginate. Uh, though, now I'm going to start doing Invisalign with my carrier at the same time. Um, I like the idea of straightening the lower teeth while I'm distalizing my upper or vice versa for a class three. So I would scan them um, and measure them for a carrier that day. And um, thanks, Tim, what's alginate? It's the stuff we eat and put in sushi. It's made of seaweed. Um, so that's, I scan. And my assistant's scanning them right next to me and I'm doing an adjustment and the kid has just started and mom fills out the paperwork and never once has anybody complained. It's, and it's not been an issue. And again, um, how much flexibility do I give my TC for discounts? Whatever she wants, whatever she wants to do. Um, you either trust your treatment coordinator or you don't. Now, I would not recommend that you hire a treatment coordinator and then say to her day one, whatever you wanna do, go for it. Uh, my treatment coordinator has been with me since the day I took over the practice three years ago. Uh, she's learned from me as we, she's watched me speak in hundreds and hundreds of consults. She knows exactly what I'm thinking. And I'll be honest, I'm the one who has a short leash. She gets to do whatever she wants. She'll come to me if she sees me make a mistake. And that's the kind of relationship I want with my treatment coordinator. So um, I'll let her do whatever she wants. And I think maybe once she did something with a down payment that I wasn't thrilled about, but the patient started. And what am I going to do? Complain? Um, $500 down, do you run the payment plan past the act of treatment? Uh, maybe I'll ask you after the session so we stay on topic, too late. Uh, and this is on topic because this is about case acceptance. Uh, I was the guy who originally felt we needed to have 20% down and that was the only way to make it work. And um, I have no problem extending the payment past uh, that, but that's an assumption we're making, uh, Leon. If we give them $500 down and a $300 a month payment plan, that may work perfectly for them. It's only when they say, oh, that's a lot of money, and even then you don't change it, you say to them, is that not doable for you? 
right? Because it's a poker match. If they say to you, oh, that's a lot of money, they may be able to afford it, but they're trying to talk you into extending the payment plans or lowering your price. And so you just say to them, is that unaffordable to you? And they might say, well, can you do something longer? I said, well, if I extend it out two more months, here's the cost. And our sheet is an Excel. So it looks like you're getting a treatment plan, but it's really behind the scenes an Excel spreadsheet. So when she changes one number, another one changes down below. And again, I can share that with you, but I don't know how I can, hopefully you'll be able to interact. And if I can't, Ruse will figure it out, so don't worry. Um, but yeah, uh, and if I find I'm getting, in some months, way too many low down payments, which happens, um, I'll increase my discount for pay in full. So all of a sudden, you know, we go from three to 450 because I need cash flow. And all of a sudden, the next week and a half, I'll get four or five pays in full. So what I'm trying to get at here is don't anybody here think that you have to lock in and be binary. It's either this or this. You have the opportunity to change things on the fly. There's nothing unfair. There's nothing unreasonable. Um, if you've got great pay in fulls one month, feel comfortable about dropping your down payments more. Get some cases started. Um, if you've got a lot of down payments that are small, increase the discount for pay in full. And you'll see, it, 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 just goes, it, it just goes hand in glove. It works beautifully. Um, how much time do I spend talking about appliances once you get them to agree about the gears? Um, oh, are we talking about like a Herbs, a Carrier, or something like that? Yeah, because like, I mean, is that part of like your case acceptance is sometimes, or at least in our area, I find, you know, parents are asking a lot about the different appliances, whether it's Invisalign or braces or Herbst or expanders. Right. So unless I've got a specific appliance in mind, which I ordinarily do, um, I'm going to go general on them. I'm not going to get into a specific about a particular appliance. But again, we're on this picture, right? We're talking about digital code diagnosis, so let's use it. So let's just say this was a full cusp class two, right? Um, you know, let me, I'm going to, if it's okay with everybody, I'm going to close out of this for just a second. And I'm going to see, bear with me for a moment because we're going to have some fun here. Um, fun, fun, fun. Okay. Oh, we got the dreaded colored wheel of death. So I'm just going to go real quickly to my jump desktop and we're going to log into my office real fast. Um, and let's just open up and see. Yes, I run tops in my office. This was a patient came in today. We just started her with my, what we're now calling IX10. It's a name we came up with for a Express 10, but um, I'm doing it for like $450 down and like $250 a month and paying it out over 10 months for just a quick Express 10 and people are loving it. And I learned that from Dr. Scott Runnels, who I told you all about, and uh, it's awesome. But let me just show you, we're gonna give you a kid who, Right, let's take this picture here. Glenn, we're still, we can still see your PowerPoint, we don't see tops. Oh, you can't, thank you. Yeah. So let's see how I can share my screen. Bear with me for a second. Pause share, resume share, and I'm gonna go, thanks for telling me. There we go, can you see that now? Nope, still PowerPoint. Still PowerPoint, son of a gun. Okay, so I'm gonna hit this, stop share. Good, we're gonna go back in, I'm gonna share the screen. And I'm going to take you here. You all can see that now, right? Yes. Okay. Yep. Th thank you. So different kind of case. Would you agree, Ohi, that this is what we're talking about? Right. Okay. Then, right. right. I'm going to walk you through this case. This was back um, about 10 months after I took over the practice. Didn't have a reputation of any kind, good or bad. And mom came into the office and... Um, you know, this is the picture I show patients, right? I told you, these are the pictures that I use. So he comes into the office. Let's just, my assistant didn't turn the flash, so I apologize. The right, retronathic. If you take a look at the Ceph, he has like zero, you know, he has a little chin button, but he's really proclined. And we talk, this was an interesting case because I, he's got a lot of space that I can bring those uh, incisors back. Um, and so... I looked at him as like a great herbs case, bring these back, advance the mandible. And we just actually took off the herbs. And I don't know, just out of curiosity. Yeah, I mean, we advanced him forward, just so you can see the case real quickly. 
but this is where we were. When I, I take the arms off for a month, right? And this is without arms, and this is where we took this kid. And um, it's really, he doesn't have a strong chin, but certainly, you know, he's got a weak chin. I told mom at the beginning that he'd need some sort of surgery to give him a stronger chin, but I could fix his occlusion. But let me just show you real quickly. This is how I talked about the case, okay? So I tell mom about the gears, and I talk to her about the thing, and now I say to her, um, so if you look on the wall over there, where is this point on this tooth striking relative to the groove? Notice I'm walking her there. I'm not making her guess, but she thinks she's guessing. Where does the point of this tooth hit on that perfect picture relative to the groove of this tooth? And she'll say, oh, it like falls into it. I say, exactly, because that's what the picture there shows. I say, so now, what about your son's tooth? Does it hit, obviously it doesn't hit here, right? And I nod, because it creates a visceral effect. She will nod back at me when I nod. So I'll say, does it hit in the groove? Or does it hit about half a molar forward of where it should be? And she'll, I'm nodding, she's nodding. I say, great. So. If I put a rubber band from here to here and pulled, that's a lot of movement we're asking to advance his lower jaw, right? She'll go, yeah. I say, so what do you think my only two options are if a rubber band is not going to pull him enough, what are my other options in, in order to move his jaw forward? Notice my wording. What are the only other options we've got if you want to move his jaw forward? Now, one of them, I bet you can guess really quickly, and uh, it involves us having to do some sort of procedure to move his jaw forward. She gets it. She goes, surgery? I go, exactly. I said, but he's a little young for surgery. I said, and I'll always say to him, exactly, you're right. Good guess. Notice I said, you're right. I want her to hear the word surgery come out of her mouth, and then I agree with her. Instead of me saying he needs surgery, and she sort of looks at me like this, she said surgery, and I agreed. It's a huge shift from a cultural perspective. So I say, yeah, exactly, good guess. But, you know, he's a little young for that. And, you know, if I, could, if I could offer you an option that might be able to avoid surgery most of the time, would you be interested in hearing about it? And then she'll say, yeah, of course I would. I say, great. So if we look at his face, you'll notice, you know, he's got a little bit of a weaker chin here, right? I mean, he's a great looking kid, but would you agree that, would you say his, actually, I screwed up there. I would say to her, would you say that he's got a strong chin or would you say it's a little bit set back? And she, of course, would say he's a little bit set back as she gazes beautifully upon her son. I'll say, if, if, if I could come up with a solution that might be able to advance him a little bit more and fix his bite at the same time, would you be interested in hearing about it? And they go, yeah, yeah, of course. I say, great. Well, there's this thing called a herbs. Then I, I open up a picture on the side of the screen and show them. And what it does is just basically, it has two little arms and it pushes the lower jaw forward. And the hope is that while we hold him in that position, because he's in his growth spurt now, the jaw is going to grow and stay in that position. And I got to tell you, there's no guarantee that it will work, but we'll, we'll find out about nine months to a year from now, whether or not it worked. And so that's what I would do if he was my son, which actually Zachary does have a herbs. <laughs> but, um, but I say, that's what I would do if he was my son how do you feel about it? And they'll say, is it painful? I say, no, no, not at all. I will tell you it's going to be more painful on you than it will be on him. And, and, and that's the conversation. And nobody questions and nobody asks why, because they understand the malocclusion. They understand the facial ramifications. They understand that rubber bands can't do it. And they understand that surgery is the option we're trying to avoid. So they jump on it. And I've had many parents come to me in a case like this, from a local orthodontist who wants to do a carrier. And while you might agree with a carrier, depending upon your, your approach, you know, I look at this, right? And, and I, I think I may even have a measurements on him. There, folks, I do trace. So please, I don't do it on every case, but I do it on when I'm 10 months in practice, I trace. Um, but, you know, I'm showing her an A and B of A, not her, but to me, um, I'm looking at my maxilla and I'm looking at my mandible. Um, and you might say based on numbers that this is a maxillary problem, but we're going to get past this for just a second. Oops, sorry, I closed out of it. Um, didn't mean to, my bad. But you get my point, right, um, about how I want to do things and how I want to I show that. Does everybody understand that okay?
Oh, hey, did that answer your question about, um, about how I talk about appliances? Yeah, because yeah, right. I mean, I, that was my feeling was that, um, you know, that's part of case acceptance is getting them to understand the different appliances that you're talking about. But I hear what you're saying about trying to keep it general and not, you know, overdoing the details of the actual appliance. If you know what appliance you're going to use, talk about it. But more importantly, let them bring you to it. Right. So if, if that was a problem in the maxilla, right, let's just say for argument's sake. Um, and can you all see the PowerPoint now? Yes. OK, so yeah. if, if we just if we just said, hey, you know what, I want to put this device that goes from here to here and I want to bring it back. I know it's a carrier. I'll say, look, if you look at his, I can't do it here. But if I said, look at his face. Doesn't he have great facial balance. And they'll say, oh, yes. I say, well, I don't want to change his face. I just want to bring his upper teeth back. And you know what? We've got a great thing that can do that nowadays. And I say, so let me show you what it is. And in that case, I'm not going to walk them through it because they're never going to guess. But I'll say, imagine if I just put a little bar from here to here and they wear a rubber band from here to here and, and they put them in a lower retainer so the lower teeth can't move. What's going to happen to the upper teeth? And then you say, they're going to go back. I say, exactly. And once I do that, we can put them into Invisalign. It'll be a piece of cake and... You know, it's going to be an easy case to move through at that point. So I hope that explains it for you, Ohi. Is that all right? Yeah, that's great. Thanks. Okay. So I see Brittany, you asked a question. What type of financial summary is the TC using? Um, it's computer generated. Um, let me see real quickly. I'm going to stop sharing here for a moment. And I'm going to go um, back into uh, my jump program. Actually, you know what? I'm going to open up in the tops. And I will let you all see exactly what she gives patients um, because I have it right here. Give me 10 seconds and I'm connecting. And while I'm connecting, I'm screen sharing and you all can see my screen here, correct? Yes. Okay. So I'm just going to go to uh, that patient. I can't see it. You, you can't see my page, Mike? No, Can it's, you, blank, it's blank screen, black screen. It's all, okay. So let me go back and I'll, I'll share again. I'm sorry. Sometimes technology can be a little challenging. Okay. Can you see it now? Yep. Okay. Yes. Now, the only problem I've got is, there we go. So administratively, uh, let's go to his iPortfolio and see. I'm just grabbing somebody. Let's go uh, do, 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 payment option. This might be it. I'm not sure. Let's see if it opens. That's my sheet. Can you all see that okay? It yes. did not come up. The sheet didn't come up. We were just looking at it. Okay. okay. I'm going to stop sharing. I'm going to reshare. It just, it's, it, it forces me to pick what I want to share. So now you can see it, right? Yes. Okay. So this was from, you can see 12 of 15. Um, my treatment fee was 64.80. I gave a holiday discount at that point of the day. Remember, I've been in practice for 10 months. Nobody knows me. Uh, this mom is active in the community. I want to get her to be a missionary. So I give her a $500 holiday discount, I called it, which she was thrilled with. Her insurance is $1,500. There's a $4,480 out of pocket. Payment option one. Well, back then, I gave a $500 discount. So she could give a one time payment of $3,980. Right? Option two, she can get a $300 discount. And her balance is forty-one eighty. She could pay two thousand ninety now and two thousand ninety in a year, or she could do five hundred dollars down. This is the payment over twenty-two months, one hundred eighty dollars a month, right? She signs it, um, dates it, it gets scanned into their chart, and that's that. And like I said, I can get you a copy of this in the next couple of days if that's if that's what you want. But this is essentially my my. A, my treatment coordinate, coordinator has this in her computer and the second she hears me talking to mom or dad she knows what I'm talking about she punches in the fee um, this automatically all populates because it's all in an Excel spreadsheet and then she just prints it out and gives it to the patient and it works really really nicely did that answer it okay for you Brittany I'll take that as a yes yes yep there we are cool um, do I use Panici's bonus system? So first, Vivian, she doesn't call it a bonus, remember? She calls them games. She feels that a bonus is something that 
is repeatable and that they take for granted. So every month there's a new game. Um, I don't uh, necessarily use all of her stuff, but I, I give a bonus based upon um, number of starts per month. Uh, we do the bag of money, which is always a fun one. Uh, we have a bag of money where there's like $500 in there and there's like 150, 520s, 10 10s, 25s, and like 50 singles or something like that. And if we get seven phone calls uh, in a day, my front desk keeps a little tick mark at the front desk and we've got a wireless doorbell. So nobody would ever know what the ding dong means. But if she gets seven phone calls for new patient exams that day, she presses the remote control, it goes ding dong, everybody hears it. They get really excited because they know that at the end of the day, they're gonna stay around, we're gonna draw from the bag of money. And they basically, they reach in, they pull a bill, whether it's a dollar or 50, it's theirs to keep. And it's fun, it's exciting. Uh, we don't really ever pull 50s, maybe once or twice, but they're excited about it. And there was one day where all four of my team members pulled 20s. And they were like so excited. And two of them had prayed together that they would pull a 20. And we just sort of like, the other two, uh, and I looked at them and go, you actually prayed together for a 20? Like, you guys are idiots. There are 50s in there. Why wouldn't you root for, uh, go for a 50? We're like, uh, what kind of idiots are you? And you're praying for 50, you should pray to win the lottery. But either way, they, they thought it was a sign from God that both of them had won $20 and I wasn't going to argue. So um, anyway, um, do you give this to the patient that you don't start? Yes. Now, Ruse, I'm going to tell you, there is only one patient type I don't give it to. Um, and I'm just going to go out there and say it. I'll let you guess which one, because I'm not going to say it out loud, but there is one ethnicity, race, religion, type, that I have a 90% case acceptance rate. There is one group of individuals who come to my office, they get a treatment plan, they take it, and they never start. And my start rate with them is less than 5%, and I track it. And I've, I've reached out to good friends of mine who are members of this, and they said to me, this is typical, and you are not going to get starts from them because they're going to go to the orthodontist who matches their ethnicity down the block, um, and they're going to take your sheet and try to um, get them down uh, financially. And they're the only ones I will not give it to. Um, Andre, I did not say a word, okay? <laughs> I'm not saying you're right, um, but I am saying that Sheldon, um, <laughs> Sheldon, who himself uh, is in this race, gave a lecture at MKS last year about why they don't start treatment in our offices um, and try to give us hints, Sheldon Salins. So my point though is, um, they're the only people who I don't give it to because they come and ask me an hour's worth of questions and never start. So what I do now, I've been experimenting. One, I never give it to mom if she says she's got to show it to dad. I say, great, have him come in. Oh, we can't. I'm sorry, we don't like to release our fees, period. And she says, no, okay. And then dad always shows up. And oddly enough, sometimes they start. Um, and the other thing I do is I've got white paper that I tried where I printed on it in big, bold letters across it. Uh, this estimate is only good in-house, not valid for other orthodontic offices. I, right, you get to make the rules. And then when she prints out a treatment form, she prints it out on that piece of paper. So that if they go to show it to somebody else, they look like idiots. Um, but Leanne Panici, we asked her when we went back a couple of weeks ago, and Leanne said basically, you have to treat everybody the same, which we do for the most part. And uh, that's just part of your case acceptance. That's part, and if it wasn't for that group, I would have like a 98% case acceptance rate. But it, they bring it down by about 10%. And my friend down the block starts them all. And I know that. So um, I know I've kept you guys here for about an hour and a quarter. Are there, are there um, ruse? About 90% of your patients are Indians? God bless you, man. I, I, I just can't get starts. And it's okay. Um, I just, I'm Jewish, and I'm trying to keep the Jewish patients from starting with me. I want to send them to somebody else. So... Um, you all can have them. You can have my folks any day of the week because they're gonna, you're going to charge less and they're going to cause you twice as much problems. So, um, yeah, so Leon asked about my class two picture and the diminutive laterals. It's real easy. And I'm just telling you, the more you make of a deal, the bigger they're going to make of a deal. So just don't make a big deal out of things. Just 
hey, and by the way, you may notice that these little te these teeth here, they're a little bit on the smaller side. So when we're done, we may leave a little bit of space so that they can be built up and match the other ones. They don't know. They're not going to fight you on it. It's only a big deal if you start talking about it for 20 minutes. You know, just, yeah, you see that? It's a little small. Um, as we get closer, we're going to look and see if the bite comes together. If, if the teeth are a little bit small for the bite to be able to come together, I may leave a little bit of space, and that way you'll get it built up. And then who's your dentist? Oh, Dr. Jackson. He's amazing. We do this all the time with him. He'll know exactly what to do. You know, if you make a big deal, it's a big deal. If you don't make a big deal, yeah, I'm sorry. I just sliced your daughter's lip in half. I cut her down through the symphysis, but it's, not, it's, it's okay. It's no big deal. She'll be okay. We're going to stitch her up. You know, she'll look like a zipper, but you know, that's attractive. So I'm just saying, don't make a big deal out of things and people will definitely roll with the punches. So um, any other questions I can answer for you all? I hope this was useful. I mean, again, I, I showed you, it's gonna be like drinking from a fire hose. Um, there's so many areas we can always go back to relative to how do we finance, um, which is a great discussion for all of us. We can always go back to Photoshop as a tool for playing around and Photoshop for me is indispensable for my marketing. Because when I, when I have a sheet come from my graphic designer, I can jump in real quick and play with it and make changes rather than going back and forth. It's kind of like ClinCheck versus ClinCheck Web, right? I can sort of adjust it and play with it and do what I want. Um, but anything you all want to follow up on, I'm happy to. Uh, I want to just say two more things real quick, so please don't run away. We'll be gone in just a second. One, um, next January, June 1st and 2nd, as you all know, is going to be the big Orthopreneurs Conference. Um, anybody who's a member of RD only pays for the food costs. I, I'm not making a penny on anybody in this group, but my food costs are like $700. So, and, and because every drop of food is covered, drink, the banquet, the party, everything. Um, and it's next June 1st and 2nd, a Friday and a Saturday here in Dallas at the Omni. The rooms are really very reasonably priced. And the fee for RD members is going to be $599, uh, which is definitely going to be very fair considering who we have coming to speak and, and food and beverage. The day before, March 31st is going to, April, um, May 31st is going to be our uh, sort of spring summer RD meeting uh, the day before. And I'm going to have a lot of the big speakers who are going to be on the big stage. I'm going to try to bring them in the day before, like Adam Mead to work on branding with us. I'm going to see if I can get um, Liam Panici in the day before to work with us. I definitely want to do a little bit of photography. And I'll throw out more details as we get going with that. But I wanted to just give you a heads up now that if you're thinking about you want to go, um, you know, I'm going to try to make it as good as I can. There's no charge for the RD meeting itself. Uh, I'm going to cover all costs, the rooms, the food, the speakers, and everything. Um, Tim, there'll be more beer than you know what to do with, okay? I saw your question. Um, I'm going to drown you like the kid, like Augustus Gloop from uh, Willy Wonka in a vat of beer. Um, so it's going to be, a, I promise you, it's going to be an amazing meeting. Um, for, for those of you who are going on the cruise, it's going to be awesome. Um, if you're not yet signed up and you want to go, again, nobody makes a penny on you other than Royal Caribbean, but I promise you it's going to be an amazing trip. Uh, for four, I just came back from a Royal Caribbean cruise, and it's, it's phenomenal. It's going to be a great meeting, great people, great time. And I think these casual conversations that we're having are really going to be even more important. You know, when there's five of us sitting around a table uh, after dinner talking about case acceptance, I think that that's where the real strength is going to come from. Uh, last but not least, Jeff Lee and I uh, were, oh, I saw you look up, Jeff. You weren't paying attention. You were playing on your phone. Um, busted. So um, Jeff and I were on the phone tonight, and uh, we came up with a great idea. It was really Jeff's idea, and yeah, it was, and we're going to run with it. Sometime between the cruise and summer, I want to organize somewhere just a simple one-day meeting where we can all get together, and everybody's admittance for fee is to bring one failure, one case that's a failure. So we can all just sit in a room in a safe environment, show our failures, and learn from each other's cases. I've done it before as a restorative dentist, and it's the most powerful day you'll ever have. And we could get there on a Friday afternoon after work, go out Friday night, Saturday do the meeting, have fun Saturday night, and fly home Sunday morning. Make it a short 36 hours, and just we can all bring some failures and just go to a room that I'll cover the cost of, and we'll just start throwing out failures. So let's think about that. I don't know if you think that's a good idea, but I, I think it would be a lot of fun. So 
Um, hit me up if you want anything. I'm always here to help you any way I can. Uh, thanks for being a part of the group. And I'm going to be reaching out, as I have, to many of you just to find out what is it you want from this group that you're not getting. What, can, what, are, you, what are we doing that you love? What can I do more of? So um, I'm just trying to dial it down. And of course, as always, if you have any friends or anybody you think would be a good fit for this group, we'll always do a geographic search so they'll never compete with anybody. But, you know, as you see, when we have a lot of people, there's a, there's a power in us sort of coming together and coalescing. So um, thanks for everything. Uh, have a great evening. And if you ever need anything, let me know. And this should be up on our site. I'm going to San Diego for a dental meeting tomorrow but I hope to have this up on our site by tomorrow afternoon. And um, thanks for staying the course. Have a great night and we'll chat soon guys. All right. Take care. Thanks Glenn. Good night. My pleasure. Have a great night.